we're so excited once again. Uh, we're glad to be here to share the Word of God. How many of you are uh, growing and feel that you're getting a good Word on a consistent basis? That you're uh, drawing up on the Word more and the Word is speaking to you when you come to different situations? Over the period of time that we've been studying, how, how many of you feel like you've grown some? One, I see somebody in the, in the office saying, <laughs> okay, I've grown. Anybody else? Sometimes you grow in your perspective and you grow in your seeing. You know, when Jesus said, except you be born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. In other words, you won't be able to discern it. Because if you don't have sight, you can't de determine what's in front of you. You'll just see the shadow. But you won't be able to determine what's in front of you. So if you can even see clearer now that you have a better understanding of the word. Because the entrance of thy word giveth light. And he said, let your eyes be full of light. So it's so important that the word continues to flow in and understand that it's just a good spiritual diet if you're not being taught a lot of religious precepts and principles and things of that nature that tells you a bunch of do's and don'ts as if that can make God function. So that's one of the reasons I like that Gyra song. I don't know if you guys know it, but uh, Maverick won the best album of the year. Uh, best New Artist of the Year, and that gyro was up for the best song, everything else. I don't know if it won any. But that particular song is one of the most ministering songs to be birthed, to be birthed out of the 2020 pandemic. Because many of those songs, some of the newer songs were birthed out of the 2020 pandemic. And what took place is, he said, I'll never be loved more than I am right now. Because you would ask yourself that question when so many people were dying around you. Well, why did they die? Were they okay with you, God? Were they saved? Were they not saved? Am I saved? You'll start asking yourself all kinds of questions. And he put in there, he says, I'll never be loved more than I am right now. Nothing I could have done to let you down because I never held you up. Ooh, my God, I changed that. God's word is so good and he's so pure and so absolute. But uh, praise God. Uh, that Just that one, my before and after, and just so many different uh, ministering songs in that album that was birthed through one of the most difficult times the world has ever seen. The world has ever seen. Mainly because of the information age and the world getting so much information. Years ago, during the uh, Spanish flu and different plagues, they'd have to wait for a letter or a Morse code or something to be shipped across the ocean in a ship to find out what was going on in Europe, what was going on in India, what was going on in Africa. They didn't have communication lines like they have now. Now, you can see in every moment. Before the Delta virus ever hit America, you see what it was doing in India. The sad thing is how they thought it wasn't going to make it to America. But nevertheless, it is good to have foresight and have insight and to have a word of God and to have the word spoken over you and to have a covenant with a God that watches over his word to perform it. So when he say he watches over to perform it, that means that it shall not return into him void. And you need to know that. You have to have an absolute. And when you trust in God, you're not trusting into some space thing. You're trusting in everything he says he is. All right, let's just do our confession. This is my Bible, the living word of God. It's not only about God, but it is God. I believe he is who he says he is. I believe he done what he said he did. I believe he can do what he says he can do. My God, I believe I am who he says I am. I believe I have what he says I have, and I believe I can do everything he says I can do. I thank you, Lord, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me from the inside out. His word is alive pure, powerful, full of faith, changing us as we hear it, as we speak it, as we think it, as we walk it. Today I am a believer. I hear in faith today. I speak in faith today. And I act on the word of God on a daily basis, and my life is the better for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. That was a good confession of faith that we made. And uh, God listened to it. He heard it. It lined up to his word and his angels that excel in strength, they hearken to the voice of his word to perform it. So you have angels and sources around you working to bring those things to pass. Hey, man, that's a powerful, powerful thing. My God, whoo, caught me up already. Listen, so 
We've had time over these last uh, few months uh, with different subjects. I don't know. Uh, when you study the Word of God, don't take it lightly. And those of you that I believe be in Bible study are not taking it lightly, and especially those that are scholars and students, you write down notes. And those of you that go to school, that go past the 12th grade and or even in the 12th grade, but those of you that go to school and go to college and stuff, you know the importance of taking notes and the importance of understanding each course. There's a reason why you learn certain things at certain levels because the time will come that you'll need it and you won't have to go back and look in the book. It'll already be internalized and it would have already been developed and enveloped with the new things you learned over that three or four year course. So some of the things you've been learning, we've looked at fortifying ourselves. How do we fortify ourselves? With the Word of God. We've, we've looked at the importance of fortifying our spirit, fortifying our soul. We understood about casting down imaginations. We fortified those things. And we also understand about putting our flesh under subjection and understanding that we are tripartite beings. So to fortify ourselves, we can't just fortify our flesh. I just can't go outside and run and uh, do weights and uh, eat right and all that and think I'm fortifying myself. I am fortifying my flesh part of myself, but my flesh part of myself does not necessarily have the ability to deal with the spirit part of myself. So we've learned that we have to fortify all parts, and we also learned over the period of the last two or three years the difference that we are tripartite beings. We are a spirit first. Afterwards, we have what's called a soul. That's our mind, our intellect, and our emotions, All right, our decision-making capacity. That is the soul. That's like the main frame of everything that happens in life. The spirit is synonymous with the heart. The soul is synonymous with the mind. The flesh is synonymous with the body. So whenever you hear the body, he's talking about what you see physical, the physical makeup of it. Even when he talks about the body of Christ and every joint supplying, he's giving you a picture to know that you can't move without both legs moving. You can't see with one eye. You can see with one eye, but with two eyes, you have a different peripheral vision to see more around you. Those things, the fact that you have two nostrils, two eyes, two ears, two hands, all right? You, you, the only thing you have one of is one heart. The only other thing you have one of is one mind. But almost every other organ, many of your organs, you have two, all right? Main function, you have two lungs. You have two kidneys, all right? One liver, but two kidneys. Those things are very important, how God put everything together. It's a fact you even have two hands. You can do a lot with one hand, but what you can do with two makes a big difference. So praise God. We thank God that he had put us together well. We've learned those things, so we expect a lot out of our spiritual life, and we expect a lot out of our soul life, because what do we do on a daily basis when we receive the Word of God? We understand that it said to submit ourselves to the Word of God. And as we submit ourselves to the Word of God, our minds are being renewed and transformed by the Word of God. So every time we get some Word, there is a renewing, a refreshing. Those of you that have phones, after a while, you use them for a while, you keep them plugged up, and you can see they get sluggish. So what do you do? You turn them off and turn them back on because they reboot. Why? Because they connect to the system. They disconnect from the whole world system, the whole Internet and all that, and Apple and this and all the systems, and they shut them down and they reboot. And they tell you every now and then you have to shut them down so that they can reboot and refresh themselves. So when you rest sometime and God puts you on a rest from the Word, don't put yourself down. Rest because things are rebooting. All right, they are rearticulating themselves, all right, restructuring themselves, finding out what counts, what doesn't count. Do you know your spirit, your soul, your mind, and your spirit walk and your faith does that on a regular basis? It actually looks back and say, okay, well, we don't have to teach you this no more. You don't have to ask if I'm going to pay your bills. You get past that. All right, you don't have to have faith to pay your, pay your bills no more. And then you start moving into faith to do what? Increase wealth. You start moving into faith to do what? Build your children's life, to speak over their destiny, to put money aside for their destiny. You start moving into another place of faith. But early on, you needed to have the faith to trust that you were going to be able to have income. But you can get past that and realize that God is, is a provider. He is who? Jaira. More than enough. He's everything you need. So we looked at those things. And we've studied them. Uh, <clears throat> knowing who you are, we understood was very important. Let's see. Jesus asked, who do men say I am? You remember he asked the disciples, and Peter said, 
Uh, the rest of them said, some say you're this, some say you're that. But Peter said, you are the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. So this couldn't have been revealed by what you see and what you hear me walking on the earth. It had to be revealed to you from the Father. He said, the Father himself revealed that to you, that you were able to see past everything physical to recognize who I am. And you recognize that I was the word of life made flesh. Peter was able to see that. And he told him, upon this revelation, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The revelation of what? That he is the word of life made flesh. That's what he builds his church upon. Knowing and recognizing who he is in this hour. So uh, last week we began to deal with the word of inquiring. Uh, last week we talked about that. Uh, I think we closed out in Mark where it says anything ye ask. And we closed out there. So over these next couple weeks, I want to just study the book of James. I want to go in the book of James. The book of James, uh, James is actually written by the biological brother of Jesus Christ, whether it's his it was uh, Joseph's son, Mary's son. I don't know. Everybody said Mary only had one son, but these were by Joseph's other wives or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't give us a specific. But we do know that he had brothers, and we do know the Pharisees, and many people knew about his brothers and his sisters. So James is actually a brother, but he doesn't identify the fact that he was a brother. He identifies that he was a believer and that Jesus Christ was the Word made life, and he understood that. But James is the New Testament wisdom book, as Proverbs is the Old Testament wisdom book. So let's go to the book of James, the first chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to go into Amplified. We're just going to be in the book of James today. I'm not going anywhere else in the Amplified. Let's start off. James, I'm going to start off in the Amplified, verse 1. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve Hebrew tribes scattered abroad among the Gentiles in the dispersion, greetings, rejoice. Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. We talked about that last week. We want to just stop here for a minute. And I want you to identify the part. It says, consider it nothing but joy. Boy, that's crazy. Joy, what? In other words, the word joy is the spiritual gift that means strength. That's why Jesus says, my joy I give unto you. When it breaks down the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians, joy. It says love, joy, and peace. Those are fruits of the Spirit. All right? So you need to know that joy is a strength. So he said, count it all strength, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. In other words, some of you fall into, but some of them are you led into. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. Not because he wasn't going to be tested, but he knew he would have been tested, but he needed to be strengthened for the journey that was before him. And what stood up in Jesus was the word of God. What stood up, what has to stand the test of time is not you, but your faith. The word of God is faith. That's what stands up. So every time he got a test, well, no matter what the devil told him, turn it, if you be the son of God, I'm gonna, if you're so bad and you know who God is, then you turn this here rocks into bread. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then he took him up to a high place and said, cast yourself down. One of his angels prevent your feet, tempt not the Lord thy God. And then eventually he said, get thee behind me, devil. <laughs> and went on about his business and started dealing with the devil until the whole course was finished out. And he said, it is finished on the cross. And when he said it is, oh, glory to God. When he said it was finished, the Bible says that the heavens began to shake. The earth shook. The whole entire world shook at its root. And then everything that was built up over the thousands of years of the temple, the whole 
temple in the middle of beyond the holies of holies. It said that the whole curtain was ripped from the top to the bottom and everything had been changed around and it went from the natural into the spiritual realm. And from that day forward, men and women were sons of God. When he went into the grave, it was no way. The Bible, Matthew says that when he came up out the grave, everything, he didn't get a chance to say when, when, the, when the father called him up, everything under there that was connected to the father started coming up out the grave. He didn't say Jesus come up because he couldn't. He had to say word of life come up. Word of life came up. And everybody that had a word in them started walking around. It says in Matthew that people came up out the grave when he came up out the grave. Oh, my God. Glory to the most high God. Anyway, so no matter what your trials that you're led into, he says, count it joy. Then he says, be assured that the testing of your faith through experience, this is very important. This is what I need you to know when you start walking with God. He's testing your faith, okay? If you start right now playing tennis, they're going to test your forearm, your back arm, your left leg, your right leg, your moving backward, your lateral movement, your upward movement, your jump. All these things are meant to strengthen you, and they are a part of that course. So once you come into the kingdom of God, the just shall live by what? Faith. So he's never testing you. God is never testing you. Get that clear. And as we finish today, well, we're going to get as far as we can get without exhausting the word of God. We just want to be able to get what we need for this moment. All right, our daily bread. But he says the testing of your faith. So what is God building? Faith. Why? Because the just shall live by what? Faith. So he builds your faith. Jesus is the high priest of our confession of faith. So he says the testing of your faith. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance, leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. You know, that's one of the most powerful statements that you can hear as a believer if you learn to walk with God for a while. That it has nothing to do with your mistakes. It has nothing to do with your shortcomings. He's talking about what's happening on the inside of you. He said it's getting ready to give you some endurance. That if I don't test you, you won't have no endurance. And do you know what? If you get ready to start playing tennis, you're going to find out when you finish with hitting them across there, come on, let's run 10 miles because you're going to need some endurance. Basketball players have to run up and down the court, up and down the court, up and down the court before they even go up and shoot just so that they can have the endurance to make it to the end of the game. Boxers have to box round after round, run up and down. Ali said he did more work out, up, and down the highways running than he did when he got under the lights to dance. But that's what gives you your endurance. So those tests and those trials is to give you endurance. So he says, leading to spiritual maturity. It says it produces endurance through experience. If your faith has not failed you, then it has not gotten strong. If you have not missed the mark, that's why many times they tell you, don't give your children everything. Uh, I think it was Deacon Myorga was telling me that somebody told me, make sure you make your kids give you something now. Because if you, if you don't make sure they learn how to give you now, they'll get their own and won't give you nothing. Because they won't even know. Because nobody never taught them and you made everything easy for them and made life about them. So they only take care of them. It's very important that you grab onto that and grab it. It says, be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. We talked about the peace that passes all understanding. I believe we talked about it last week. I know we talked about it on that Sunday. That's the type of peace. Spiritual maturity gives you a peace in the middle of everything that's going on around you. And that peace comes from the inside, not the peace that you get from the world. See, there's a peace that comes from the world. I can give you some peace right now. Go hit the lottery. You're going to feel a lot of peace. A lot of peace until the world hits you from every which side. And you're going to say, I thought money would have gave me peace. That's because it's outward peace. But if you would have got the inward peace first and got the money, you'd still have peace because you still have purpose with the peace and the money. It makes a big difference. Let's go forward. It says, and let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work. So some things have to come through enduring faith. He said, let endurance... He says, and let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work. Some things only happens through enduring. You can't get it 
just sprinting a hundred. You've got to run the mile and a half. Some things come through going the mile and a half. Some things go through hitting the bottom and having to get back up. Some thing goes through missing the mark and having to come back and say, God, you said that you would forgive me and you're just to forgive me of every sin. You have to be able to go through that. If you say, oh, I have never sinned. Um, you just follow me. I'm just, I never do anything wrong. That's just a liar right there. Because he says, if a man say he has not sinned, he is a liar. That's what God said. So if God says he's a liar, so if you hear somebody saying, oh, I never sinned, then they're a liar. So what you do, you get away from liars because they're being directed by the devil. They just got a religious devil. All right, and they're trying to teach you something that is contrary to the word of God. Okay, when you start finding those signals, you, you get away from people like that. You know, bad teacher tell you you don't need mathematics, and you know you got a problem. You'll never get nowhere in life. Same thing with these type of things. So he says, endurance is perfect result, and do a thorough work, so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. So if you have developed faith, that means that you have the full circle. That means you have increasing faith, you have great faith, you have ever-increasing faith, you have working faith, all right? You have already passed through little faith, because there was a place where people had little faith, and Jesus says, why ye have little faith? And there was a place where Jesus told them that it was because of your faith that you couldn't cast the devil out. But he said, pray for faith. And he says it was, but he said this demon can come out by faith. People say by, uh, uh, by prayer and fasting, but the fasting part was added on also. It was talking about faith and prayer because the prayer of faith, the effectual fervent prayer of faith, availeth much. All right, the prayer of faith. That there be sick, any sick among you, pray what? The prayer of faith. What is the prayer of faith? The the the, the prayer of faith is the word. The, the prayer that lines up to the word and decrees it and declares it in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. That's the prayer of faith. It lines up to the word. And then that, that's what he says. Perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking nothing. That means you have endured, you have spiritual maturity. And one thing about spiritual maturity is, it's like your grandmamas used to say. Don't worry, just hold on, God's coming through. He always come through. He might not come through like you want him to, but he'll come through. But it'd be nice if he just shows up in, in the 12th grade and, and you become a prodigy and they tell you, hey, guess what? You can go right to college and graduate today and here's your job right here at Amazon and they're going to pay you a billion dollars a year because you're great. But more than likely, that's not going to happen. <laughs> okay? More than likely, that's not going to happen. You're going to be disappointed. you have some people that dislike you. You're going to run into some bullies. You're going to run into some difficult times. You're going to run into some books you don't understand. You can't comprehend. But as you grow and as you develop and as God brings people in your life, you're going to be able to use those things and you're going to be developed for the course and the purpose that God has planned for you. All right? All right. Praise God. Perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. Say shalom. Shalom is the peace that God said he gives you. Shalom. That means nothing broken, nothing missing. Mm -hmm. That's important. For he said he will keep him in perfect peace whose what? Mind. The soul is stayed on him. How do you keep it stayed on him? That means that whenever you're, when I say keep your mind stayed on him, you don't go walking around. God said this. God said that. God said this. God said that. You know, all you have to do is run around and love people because he said, love your neighbor as you love me. And if you act in love, you're doing the full law. Jesus said, if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, that's the completeness of it. Love God first. When you start loving people and you start saying, how can I help and doing for God's creation and humanity, do you know that's serving God? That's staying in faith. That's trusting in him. You know, that's what that's all about. Okay, when you start loving, when you start hating, you start operating outside of God's realm. So whoever the person is, you know, John begins to talk about it in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. That if you love your brother, you hate him for no cause and things like that. He begins to tell you that you have not really seen God. You may have heard about him. You may have heard about his religion. But, or you heard about the religion, and but you never had a relationship with God. Because once you have a relationship with God, you start saying different things. You say, I can't be a ship owner no more. Amazing grace. That man that wrote that song, he was a slave ship owner. Or the guy that his daughter, all his daughters, his wife, everybody died, and he's saying, it is well. 
with my soul. You start having a different understanding of who God is and you start loving God's creation and appreciating the life that you have on this earth. And you cannot hate. It's impossible. You can dislike, you can be angry, you can have a lot of things. But once God gets a hold of your heart and that word takes root, there's going to be something inside of you called love that's going to flow out of you and that's going to emanate out of you. And what does the word of God say in the book of Galatians? Faith works by love. Faith, which worketh by love. Love fortifies faith. Why? Because God is love. God is not faith, but he doesn't operate without it. But God is love. So if you ever really want your faith to grow and increase, do what? Increase in love. And how do you increase in love? You act on love. You show yourself friendly, and you'll have friends. You sow love, you'll reap love. Praise God. Let's keep going here. Let's go here. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God, who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. Okay, we're going to stop right there. We talked about inquiring of God. We talked about the, who inquired of God and how you go to inquire of God, how you go in a worshipful place. Here we find a place where it says that if you lack wisdom. Why? Because just because you have endurance and just because you have faith don't mean you have wisdom for the particular place you're at. In other words, if I leave here now and go to Kenya... Or, or go to another country in Africa, I am going to have to find out how to operate if it's at night. If I hear a hyena, what do I do? If I hear a lion, how do I respond? Where do I stand? Because it doesn't mean just because you got a lion, get your gun, you can kill him. That's the movies, but that's not might not be the reality of Africa. <clears throat> so God says, if any of you lack anything, ask him of wisdom. I might as well leave the top off of this stuff. <laughs> and it says, if you lack anything, if if you if says if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance. Let's look at that right there. We consider wisdom to be the skillful use of knowledge and understanding. Because you can have knowledge of how to make a cake, but you may not understand that you can't put it all in there together at the same time. All right. So wisdom requires you to know all the ingredients. The knowledge tells you the ingredients, but the understanding tells you what? There's a, a, a procedure of how you put it together. You understand you can't mix it all together, so what do you need? You need wisdom to know how to do it. Wisdom is the skill for use of knowledge and understanding. That's why he said wisdom is a principal thing. He says, so get wisdom. By all means, get wisdom. But with all you're getting of wisdom, get what? Understanding. You have to understand what you're dealing with for that particular season or that particular circumstance. And that's why you have to draw from the knowledge of people that are around you. When you ask God for wisdom, understand something. He can send you wisdom based on where you're at. And he'll bring people in your life to help guide you for that situation. That's why it's so important to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to see God's hand when he brings people in your life. To know God's hand when he brings people in your life. You have to be able to recognize and feel comfortable. There should be an inner compass inside of you when you start walking with God. If it does not line up with your spirit, they're not of God nine times out of ten. Some stuff will just irk you and you'll just know, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. God's not getting ready to send somebody in here to help me to cuss me out. Cuss me out. They're listening to music I don't like. They're talking about their parents. I love my parents. They're telling me to disrespect the man of God, the woman of God. They're telling me to disrespect my brothers and my sisters. This is not God. So that's a person that completely has not been sent to you. That's a counterfeit. Because the devil is in that same realm. So when, it, when the, the message comes through, he's always trying to reach in and grab it in advance. You know, he sees you when you jump up and dance around the church and you fall out on the floor or you in your closet and worship and you come out and he sees that light all on you and that joy. He's trying to figure out, well, what he got to do? What happened when she was in there? What's going on? Let me see who she called first. And then, he's, oh, girl, guess what happened? Oh, that's what happened. Oh, oh, 
oh, God, then, then now he's getting ready to start trying to send all type of traps in the way and try to intervene and cause a problem to prevent it from happening. So it's so important sometimes when the Bible begins to tell you, be careful what you release out of your mouth because the little bird will go and tell. Because it's very important that you be very careful and learn how. Later on, we're going to read this in here when he, he begins to talk about be quick to listen, be slow to speak. And he begins to talk about your tongue and how to use it. But we're not dealing with that today. We're going to deal right where we're at. That you need wisdom for decisions or circumstances. Now, we talked about inquiring from God as to where we should be and what we should do. Now, he's telling you that I need you to ask me for wisdom right now where you're at. You're on here. You have the necessary faith. You've seen your faith bring things about. If it didn't bring nothing about but got you from being on a bicycle, on a bus, to a car, you have faith. You have faith. So your faith works. You know your faith works. So now, God, where do you want me positioned? Because it must be more than this because he is a what kind of God? He is always what? The Spirit of the Lord. God said, and what happened? The Spirit of the Lord moved. Every time you see God coming in contact with people, what are they doing? Moving. So wherever you're at, there's still movement. If it's moving your children, there's movement that is in your life. Whether you're directing, instructing people to move, God has movement in your life. Movement. So you're going to have decisions and things you're going to have to make for the circumstance. We know the circumstances we're in in America right now. We can see a lot of things. We see another level of hate. We see a level of racism. We see a lot of destruction. We see things happening. We see killing. All right? We see a whole lot of division. We see death. We see confusion. We see misinformation. We see lust. They don't even talk about human trafficking no more as if it stopped. Okay, you don't even hear about that. That's not even an issue anymore. Now this is the issue. We, there's so much division. So there are a lot of things going on. That's why you have to have a peace in the storm. That's why Jesus came and he told the wind, peace be still. They got all scared, all the ocean. Wherever Jesus is, you don't never have to fear. That's what that whole parable is about. They had the living word on the boat with them, and they were scared of the wind and everything around them. And he said, why did you fear? Where is your faith? And then he said, peace, be still. And they said, what kind of man is this? That the winds and everything obey him. That's who you need to know is on your ship right now, inside of your heart. And he'll never leave you and never forsake you. Him. So he's not moved by what's around him. He's not moved. No, 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 no. He's not surprised. He's not moved. So what should we be doing? Ask for wisdom. For the circumstance and the situation that we're at. Because otherwise, he'll trick you and you'll keep making foolish movements. And some foolish things can happen. And there will be a result. Because they have already been put in place. Things have already been put in motion. What are you talking about, Pastor? God's not going to come in. If, if, you, if you know you're not married and you're not supposed to be having sex without protection. And you have sex without protection. God's not going to come in and prevent that baby from transferring. Okay, going, oh, well, well if, if, if it's not of God, the baby, I won't get pregnant. No, 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 no. You were already set up when he created you to be able to bring forth children. You know what I mean? Once you go through puberty, you're ready to go. You know what I mean? You're not going to be able to stop that. The decision has to be different for you. I didn't say violation. That's another subject. We'll get there. But what I'm talking about is you need wisdom at this hour. So ask God for wisdom. For whatever you're dealing with, whatever situation you're in, and whatever circumstance, it says that he gives it to you. And it's, it's, it's amazing how he put this together. It said, he is to ask of our benevolent God. Benevolence means that there ain't no reason. He's just giving all the time. He just wants to help you. Who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. This is important. When you ask for help, he's sending all the help he can. Generously. He's not going to rebuke you for what happened. Why are you in that position? The fact that you asked him. The fact that you asked him make the difference. Now this particular word ask is used uh, from Ephesians to 1 John. It's used a couple other times in the Gospels. 
But in the book of Revelation, that the word ask is not even in the book of Revelation. It's a wrap then. You can't ask nothing. It's over. <laughs> I mean, it's on. All right, you gonna be all right, if you want to ask that hey, you ain't gonna hear no ask nothing. The word ask is not even in there, okay, in the book of Revelations. All right, but this particular word ask is a he tail. It means a general or to desire. It connects to a word called a heel. It is a verb, which means it's an action. It means that when I ask, I'm expecting movement. When I ask, I'm moving. I'm moving forward. A verb is an action word. So asking is an action word. And if it's an action word, it has a what? Reaction. Okay, action words have reactions. That's why they're action words. So it is a verb, a heel. And it says frequently suggests the attitude of a suppliant, the one who is lesser in position to whom the petition is made. So when I ask, I generally, it says, that the person that is asking is always asking to authority. When you get ready to buy a house and you fill out an application, the application is a form of asking. And when you ask and they come back and they say, uh, well, I'm sorry, we need you to fix this, we want you to fix that. Can you get this verification? Can you verify this? Do you have any 401ks put aside? Do you have three months put aside saving? Do you have this? Do you have that? So it was in the asking because they're saying that they still want to qualify you, but you need to have some things together for when you ask. So usually when you're asking of God, you know he's qualified to give it to you. The problem is we will ask for God for something, but we want him to answer it the way we want to answer it. God, is he for me? Because you know he's so nice. He's so sweet. I love him. He's everything I ever dreamed about. But where did you get the dream from and who gave you the dream of who he is supposed to be? Did it come from the inside or did they show you the picture of tall, dark, and handsome? You got men right now that are just after one kind of woman. They got to look like all the women on TV, all the women that are all stars. If they don't look like that, they don't want them. They are missing the best people to raise their children. They are missing the best people to make them happy. They are missing the best person to teach them what real love is about. Because they have been sold a picture from the outside that they eternalize and they believe that's where their happiness is. So when you start asking from God, when you ask God, you're expecting him to give you liberally the wisdom for the motion that you're in and for the season that you're in. That's why I said we fortified us and we, we looked at uh, recognizing the seasons that we were in. Remember? So now that you know and you recognize that and you've asked God and you went through that and you've got that word and you studied it that week, you got back, you seen Sunday, you got the messages that we put back on there that need to be... Uh, uh, verified in your life and need to be fortified. You got those and then we went on and right now we're here. So now you know that you can ask God. You can ask God. Mm, my God. You can ask him for wisdom and he gives it to you. Let's move forward. I want to go just a little bit further here. Let's go into uh, verses 6. But he must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help, without doubting, God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. What's the wind? Where's the wind at? On the outside. What moves the ocean? It's the currents inside and the wind. You can see when it's really windy, the ocean is more busy. You would wonder how the wind can move a big ocean so deep but when it's windy, the ocean just turns and turns because the wind has the ability to be one with the water because water and wind connect, okay? When water rains, it's, you can feel the moisture. Dew has moisture and it's windy. So he says, by every wind of doctrine, tossed to and fro. He says, when you ask him, you need to know that you're in faith. So when you start asking God about something, be ready to get a real answer to move forward. Be ready. And, and he said, do not be doubtful. Don't doubt. When you ask God, know that he's capable. When you get ready to go for a mortgage, you're not going around the corner to the title loan place to ask them for a mortgage, are you? Because you know it says title loan, and the best of your knowledge, the people that go in there, go in there for cars to get small loans on titles. You already know that. You know it's dangerous and you shouldn't do it because it's way over. Paycheck loans. You're not going to the payday place or the check cashing place at the liquor store where it says get your bottle and a check cash at the same time. 
checking booze together. You're not going there to get a mortgage. You're going to a place that say, we do mortgages. And they look like they do mortgages. It's a bank. It's an organization. It's somebody that you heard of, know about, and are in position to do that. That's how you know who your God is. So no matter what you're facing, you know your God is capable and able, and you have no reason to doubt his capability or his power, and you've already confessed, I believe he can do what he says he can do. And if he said, if you ask me, I'll show you great and mighty things that I know not, you ask him. If he said, you can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need, you can ask him. No matter what your situation is, you can ask of God. He's ready to give you wisdom, and he's ready to answer your problem for what? The circumstance or the situation that you're dealing with. This is good stuff here today. This should help you in your faith walk. He is to ask of our benevolent God, who gives to everyone generously without rebuke or blame, and it will be given him. But he must ask for wisdom in faith, without doubting God's willingness to help. For the one who doubts, it's like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. For such a person ought not to think or expect that he will receive anything at all from the Lord. That's a very, very powerful statement. So I would put 6 and 7 together. And if you put verse 6 and 7 together, I actually have put 7 and 8 together. Yeah, let me put 8 in there too. Being a double-minded man, unstable and restless in all his ways and everything he thinks, feels, or decides. You got you to gotta understand what that means to God. When you ask God, you have to know what you're asking him for and be sincere and serious about it. All right? Just be sincere and serious about it. First off, you got to settle that he wants to help you. And God's helping you is not based on him loving you because he said he will love you forever with the everlasting love. And you can never be loved any more than you are right now. So that's not a question if he loves me. Does he want to help my situation and my timing and where I'm at? Mm, man, I, can, I done used up this time. I didn't even finish reading the scriptures. Okay. Does he want to help me? Yes. Does he want to make my life better? Yes. Does he want to bring purposes about in my life? Yes. Has he created me with gifts and talents? Yes. So when I ask him to help for something that is pertaining to humanity, my gifts, my purpose, his plan on my life to give me an expected end, does he want to give me the information? Yes. But when I ask him and he answers me and I go back to doing what I used to do, what I do is I take away the validity of asking him. I ask him unstable when I ask him. Well, uh, if you pay my rent this time, you know, I ain't going to gamble no more, Lord. So then the rent gets paid. Then the next week you go gamble. Ouch. Mm. Who said that? Mm. I heard that in the spirit. Okay. You get that thing straightened out in Jesus' name. All right. Praise God. Nevertheless, whenever you ask God of something, be serious and do not be wishy-washy. All right. In the Old Testament, he said, let, not, let that man not even ask. And he talks talk about when you start making commitments to God and, and, and saying things and start making deals and putting out fleeces to God and stuff. If you do this, I'm going to do this. If you do this, I'm going to do that. I would tell you that in the place of faith today, you don't have to do that because you have an advocate in heaven. His name is Jesus. You have the blood of Jesus over you, and you also have a spirit called the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit who lives with you. That's the paracletus that walks aside of you. So you don't have to put forth fleeces. So I would say not to do a fleece. There are some people who say they still do them as Gideon put forth a fleece, but that was a different time. I would never question God and ask God, well, uh, if you really be God and telling me to do this, let the do be on the ground and not on the fleece and all that. No, 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 no. Don't try that. So if you really be God, send Jesus in here tonight and all that stuff. Don't, don't even go there. You're not that important, trust me. All right? You, you, you're, you're not that important, okay? Stop it, all right? Your job is to come into the obedience and to accept Jesus Christ as the truth, the way, and the life, and to go forward in life and receive him. And then you become a son. And you live that by faith and you believe that from that day forward. And from then on, you deal with God through Jesus Christ. He is the only mediator. All right? 
the Father, okay? You deal right through Jesus Christ. You have direct access. As long as you're in Christ, you have direct access. You're sitting right next to him. You're joint heirs with him, all right? You're right there with God. You can deal with him. You start trying to play around Christ and start questioning Christ and all that, you're going to and fro and you're not getting ready to expect anything from God. In other words, I don't have time. That's like a little, some of you got uh, eight-year-old children, 10-year-old children, they ask you for the keys to the car. Did, did, did he even expect it? <laughs> did he, did, I mean, what in his wildest dream think I'm going to say yes? He's seen his big sister ass at 18, so now he comes and asks at, at, at 8, well, let me use the car too. That doesn't even make sense. So those are some of the things God's talking about. You know, you're working at McDonald's and you tell God you want this and you want that. But instead of asking God for the house, you say, God, position me where I can be for this moment. But also give me the means to be able to purchase that house. Because so far, everybody I see that gets a house, they purchase it with something. Okay, so you need means. Ask God accordingly and you want to ask in wisdom. All right, we'll deal with that next week because I want to finish a couple of these scriptures. I wanted to get down here to uh, at least verse 13. I had not even got down there. I don't know if I'll get there today. I guess we'll pick up. We'll be here next week, and uh, we'll pick up. I was planning on getting to 17 and 18, but I think I'm already almost at 8 o'clock. Is it 8 yet? Yeah, Five minutes till? It's 8.05? Yeah. Oh, I'm past 8 o'clock. Okay. I want to finish this one, this other part. Uh, for such a person, I'm not to think he should expect that he will receive anything at all from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable and restless, uh, and uh, restless in all his ways, in everything he thinks, feels, or decides. Mm. All right, we'll stop right there in verse 7 and 8. I'm going to read that 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So he says that we'll, we'll stop right there, verse 8, and we'll pick up uh, at verse number 9. Because I want 9 and 10 to kind of go together. Uh, yeah, we want 9 and 10 to go together, 11 and 12. So we're not going to be able to finish that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the uh, lines. Now right time for offering, if you could repeat after me. Because I tithe and God is faithful to his word, there's provision in my house. I'm a cheerful giver, a seed sower and a harvest reaper. My harvest includes houses, lands, checks in the mail, open doors and promotions, business opportunities, money in my hands, debts canceled, inheritances, and more. My seed is physical and financial, so I expect a physical and a financial harvest. According to the word of God, as long as there's remains, there shall be seed time and harvest. So I give in faith, expecting my harvest. In Jesus' name, amen. You can also give your tithe and offering to Zelle, and the handle is 562-659-4127. The handle for Cash App is Greater Works LA, and you can also send your tithing to P.O. Box 11744, Carson, California, 90749. Let's rest the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who gave, Lord, and those who couldn't. And we also thank you in advance, Lord, because we know you're going to provide. We thank you for using us in your kingdom, Lord, and we ask that you continue to use us so we can help those in agony and pain. We bless this offering now in Jesus' name. Amen.